Hi everybody. Welcome back to Paleo Cooking Live, but today it's Paleo Baking Live. And for the next couple weeks, I'm going to be sharing with you some of my favorite paleo recipes. Although I hesitate to use the word paleo because I don't think cavemen actually baked, but it's kind of the universal term for all different kinds of baking that are grain-free, gluten-free, and dairy-free, but I prefer to call it grain-free baking, but semantics, okay? So the thing that I was thinking, because of course I've been a pastry chef for a long time, was that I was really missing a lot of the pastries that I used to bake, especially for the holidays. And my family grew up with so many fun things that I used to bake that I can't eat anymore. And why should everybody else suffer? But then why should they get to eat it and I can't? So, you know, quite the dilemma, right? <laughs> so I've decided that, you know, over the last few years, I've been redeveloping a lot of my old baking recipes with new ingredients. And I thought this might be a fun time to start sharing some of those with you. We've spent almost a whole year together working on redeveloping and reimagining other savory recipes with um, paleo and Whole30 compatible ingredients. So let's do a little food freedom and have some fun baking holiday things that we can share with our family and friends. You'll probably want to brag that they're grain-free and low glycemic because the sugars that I use are very low glycemic, but you might decide to keep it a secret too because they're so good, no one will ever know the difference. So today I'm gonna to show you my holiday biscotti. It has cranberries and pistachios, which gives it fun red and green flecks and it has anise seeds, which is one of my favorite flavorings because it's very European. I love that little bit of licorice hint. And I just put the whole seed in. So um, I'm gonna show you how that all comes together. And I'm also using some unique ingredients that you may not be familiar with. The first one is coconut sugar. This is what coconut sugar looks like. It's just, like granulated sugar, but it's unprocessed and it's very low glycemic, which means when it hits your bloodstream, you're not gonna get that, you know, jacked up feeling like you do with a lot of sugar. And the other ingredient that I'm using is called palm shortening. So it's gonna be similar to a Crisco, but not the hydrogenated fat. It's a palm fruit, and it's actually considered red, but it has this yellow color. That's natural. It's not dyed. It doesn't have any artificial colors. But this is a good substitute for butter because we're not doing any dairy. And I find in some recipes, this type of a product works better than trying to use ghee, which is clarified butter and doesn't have those fat solids because they've been removed. So couple of tips to start off with. I already have over here in my KitchenAid some of the coconut sugar and palm sugar going in the bowl. I'll show you what that looks like. That's what that looks like right now. It's been creaming together. I like to use the creaming method, but you can see it's still kind of, kind of granular. So I'm gonna put that back on. I got that going just to give myself a head start before I came on live. If you don't have a KitchenAid mixer, you can use a hand mixer with a bowl. You can even do this by hand with, with a you know spatula or a wooden spoon. I just like to do the um, mixer because I'm so used to it. And this is my old Bessie, you've seen her before. She's 27 years old. She's been with me for a long time and been through some real serious stuff with me. <laughs> so now to this um, granulated sugar and um, coconut palm fat, sorry, uh, just scraping down the bowl. It's important that you scrape down the bowl in between each addition. I'm gonna add some maple syrup, okay? So this is a quarter cup of maple syrup going in and this recipe will be on the website later today. And now I'm just gonna go ahead and incorporate that in. Hopefully you can hear me over the mixer. And then I'm gonna add 
three eggs, which I already have broken here with a little bit of vanilla, about a teaspoon of vanilla. And I've already blended the dry ingredients together. So you can see here I have, and I'm just gonna use my whisk to blend these together while that's mixing. I have two and a half cups of almond flour, a cup and a half of tapioca flour, a quarter cup of coconut flour. Now those are actually all available at your local grocery store. It was actually at my local grocery store yesterday at my Publix. And they carry all of these ingredients. A year ago, you couldn't find them. And then it has a teaspoon of salt and a teaspoon and a half of baking powder. Now, baking powder contains a grain. It's typically made with cornstarch. So what I do is, baking powder is basically baking soda and cornstarch. That's all it is. So I mix my own baking powder with baking soda and cream of tartar. Cream of tartar is a very easy thing to find. It's in the spice section of the grocery store or the baking section. You can also find it on Amazon. I buy a giant one pound container. And then I can mix my own baking powder without having to worry about having the grain since corn is a grain. Also, be careful when you're buying certain ingredients like things that you wouldn't expect to have additives. These are organic cranberries. Of course, they're sweetened with sugar because you couldn't eat a cranberry without it being sweetened. But I did see some cranberries by certain larger brand companies that had corn fiber and some other ingredients that I don't really understand why they're there. So you think you're just buying cranberries, definitely check the labels because we're trying to keep this as unprocessed as possible. So let me step back over to the mixer. I'm gonna scrape this down again. And it's starting to get nice and creamy. And it's good to always use this creaming method. You can see here how nice and creamy it's getting. And that nice rich color from the coconut sugar and the maple syrup. So now I'm gonna add the eggs one at a time. And I add them one at a time because if you add them too fast, that much liquid going into the um, very dense uh, isn't gonna blend well. So I've just got them here and I just kind of pour them in one at a time. There goes one. I'm gonna let that blend in. I'm sorry my camera can't look down into the bowl for you, but when I'm done adding the eggs, I'll show you how nice and smooth it's coming together. And I always do it on slow. I think it's important to not try and, you know, really agitate the mix too much. Now, since we're not using flour that contains gluten, we wanna make sure that we mix it very well. You can't really overmix it because these are more uh, granular because of the nuts and the root that they come from. And they're, um, they're gonna get absorbed. The liquid is gonna get absorbed into these um, grains. They're not really grains, but into these fibers. And you don't want them to get too, um, stay too dry. You want them to absorb because that's what's gonna mimic what happens with gluten. When you bake with gluten, there's something called a short dough, which is something where the gluten has not been developed. That's like a cookie or a shortbread or a quick bread like a pound cake or um, any other kind of cake. The crumb is going to have a very fine texture. Then the more you develop the gluten, you develop that elastic and it gets stretchy and that's how you get bread. So I'm sure you're kind of aware of those basic principles when it comes to gluten baking. Gluten-free baking, it's not the same at all. These have to absorb the liquid to mimic that type of texture. And then we'll use things that um, also help with that elastic type texture when we're doing bread, something like psyllium husk really helps. And one day when we do bread together, I'll show you how that works. So I just added the second egg. Now that's blending in really well, so I'm just gonna go ahead and add the third one right in. So that's the vanilla with the three eggs. 
and then I'm gonna add the dry. I will scrape it down one more time. You'll see this comes together really quickly. And I mix the anise seeds in with the dry. And the reason I did that is because if I put the dry in and then I add the inclusions, the anise seeds are so small, they're gonna stick in one place to that wet dough and then they're just gonna stay in one place and somebody's gonna get a giant bite of anise seeds and nobody's gonna get the rest of it. It's gonna all end up in one cookie. I'm gonna scrape this down one more time and it's very liquidy now. I'll show you how that looks since the bowl did me a favor and came off anyway. <laughs> so that's how it looks. It's very wet. Sorry, it's a little dark. And now we'll start adding the dry. In fact, I'm gonna do that right off the mixer. I'll go ahead and add part of it. I like to do half and then the other half just to give it a chance to blend in. So that's about half. And you can see I mixed everything together with that whisk. I like to use the whisk to break up any lumps because sometimes almond flour will get a little lumpy from the moisture that it has naturally. And we'll put this guy back on. And again, very slow because you don't want that dust explosion to happen. And that's coming together. And now we'll just go ahead and add the rest. And I just like to add it while the paddle's going on slow. And that's all in. And before it gets completely mixed in, I'm gonna throw in these inclusions. This is a half a cup of pistachios and a quarter cup of cranberries. Is that right? Yep. And again, this will all be on the website. Now we're just gonna let that go because I like to make sure that all those dry ingredients get absorbed as I was describing earlier. Okay, so you don't have to refrigerate this dough overnight, but I like to just to make it easier. Um, I did make a batch and refrigerate that last night. So it was ready to show you this morning. I think this looks really good. Just gonna turn it off for a second. And I'll show you what the dough looks like after it's been refrigerated. So I just wrapped it in plastic wrap. I know the plastic wrap isn't the most ecological solution, but I've been using plastic wrap for a really long time. It's just one of those things that you do in the kitchen. So. Um, one of these days when I come up with a better answer, I'll give you a better option. But right now, <laughs> that's what I use. I just have a little tapioca flour here. I'm gonna dust this board just a little bit. And I'm gonna put the, the, peel off the plastic wrap and put the dough right on there. And then I'm gonna shape it into a loaf shape. I don't like to use a lot of flour because I don't want them to look dusty when I bake them. So you can see this dough has a really nice texture. It's a little sticky, but it's not super sticky. I can handle it with my fingers slightly dusted. And now I'm going to show you how I pan it up. Sheet pans are essential in a baking kitchen. Of course, I do a lot of cooking on them as well, but these really are, this is a quarter sheet. This is brand new. This is what they look like after you've used them for 20 years. They still work. And this is a half sheet, okay? And I've got parchment paper here. I like the unbleached parchment paper. A full sheet would be two of these put together. That's not gonna fit in a residential or home oven, but that's what we used all the time in a commercial oven. But I love my half sheets. And I love my quarter sheets. So what I'm gonna do is pan this up on a quarter sheet, I'm just gonna cut this paper in half to fit because these papers are already cut to fit a half sheet pan. I buy them on Amazon this way. Just gonna fold it in half and then take my knife and go right through it, right through that seam. And that's it. And it fits perfectly in the sheet pan 
Now I'm just gonna lift this up because I wanna get that extra dough off of the cutting board and put it right onto the sheet pan. And I love my offset spatulas. Offset spatulas, I have them in a couple different sizes. You can see they're great for decorating, removing pro product, ingredients, things like this. You can scrape your board with it, get everything nice and clean. And now I'm just gonna spread this out the rest of the way. If you can see how that looks, it's a little thick because these will rise because of the baking powder. So I'm gonna spread this out almost to the length of the pan, just pressing gently because you don't want too many finger marks. They will bake out, but you wanna make sure that you have them nice and smooth for the most part and squared off. It will rise a little bit in the middle. It's gonna look like a loaf. And about a half to three quarter inch thick. And this will go in a preheated oven for 25 minutes, 350 degrees. to show you now is how it looks when they're done. I've already baked off some and I've already cut some of it and I just use a serrated knife. So I'm just going to take this paper. Hello, my little camera that follows me. Come this way. <laughs> there you go. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> so now if this was a hot pan of course I would have my mitt on but it's um, a little cooled off now I let them cool but not completely this is still a little warm to the touch and then I use my serrated knife and I just first I take the end off let me turn it around and show you on this side and I like to do it at a little bit of an angle and the reason for that is it gives you more surface area. Just like when I cut carrots or parsnips or any of my root vegetables and I always kind of cut them on, a, on an angle, um, anything like that that you cut on a bias, you're gonna get more surface area. And that really helps dry these out when they go in for the second bake. So now I'm just gonna go about the width of the narrow part of my knife. I'm using a serrated knife, which is like a bread knife. It's got the ridges. And because of the inclusions, the, the nuts and the cranberries, you wanna do a sawing motion so you go through everything. If you just try and push, you're gonna crack the cookie in half. And that happens anyway, but I'll show you my best trick. So I'm going about the same width as the front blade of the knife, and I can just lay it down like that and put my finger and then start to saw. And make sure you go all the way through. And the same thing all the way across. So again, like I said, I baked these for 25 minutes. I let them cool slightly, about maybe 20 minutes they cooled. But this process has to happen all at the same time. It's okay to make the dough in advance and refrigerate it, but then once you start baking, you have to keep the baking process going. You can't let this cool completely and then go back to it. And yes, it does develop a little bit of cracking on the top, but if you're careful with how you cut, you can go right through it. There we go. And now I'm just gonna take the paper and lift it up and put it right back. And don't worry if you cut through the paper a little bit, it's no big deal. You can also do this on silicone mats if you have those, but do not cut on the silicone mats because you will go through them and ruin them. So I'm just gonna put that right back on to the sheet pan and now I'm going to flip them so they lay flat because these are going back in the oven for 10 minutes and then we turn them all over and bake them again for an additional 10 minutes. And if a cranberry or one of the nuts falls out, just put it right back in. But look how cute these are with their red and green specks. Aren't they fun? So I'm gonna put these in the oven and then I'll show you what they look like finished. And the make, this makes your kitchen smell amazing. In case you didn't know that before. The 
these are still warm. And there is the finished biscotti. So I baked these for 10 minutes. Then I just, when the timer went off, opened the oven and I just did one of these. You can do it right on the sheet pan with the oven door open. You just flip them like that. Flip, 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 all the way down the row. And if you're doing a big batch of them, you can do them on a half sheet pan. Just leave a little bit of space at the end of each row so when you roll them, they flip the other way and then they go back in for another 10 minutes. You get this beautiful, crispy, hard, still hot biscotti that is perfect for dipping in your latte or just munching on. I served some biscotti on Thanksgiving with a little dairy-free pumpkin creme brulee that I made with coconut milk. And then I just laid the biscotti on the top. It was the perfect crunch to the creamy dessert. So that's it for today. That's how I make biscotti. It's so simple. I hope you try it. If you do try it, post a picture of it on Instagram or Facebook and tag me so I can see your results because I love to see how things work out. And if they don't work out, let me know that too because I can help you. I'm good at troubleshooting. So thanks for joining me today. It's been a lot of fun. I'm gonna be back next week with more baking recipes. And let me also remind you that I am now taking enrollment for my Whole30 in January. We're gonna have lots of fun on our food freedom for the holidays and indulge in some healthier options for baking. But January 4th, we're back on Whole30. 30 days to a new, healthier you. Make sure you just message me on my Instagram or Facebook or drop me a message on my website. Check out this recipe, it'll be up later today. Thanks for joining me and have a wonderful day. I'm gonna come around now and turn off the camera. <laughs> He's finally following me. <laughs> Bye-bye.